I think he's trying to fool me this morning. Good morning to you all. Please be seated. Welcome to our 11 o'clock service this last Sunday after the Epiphany, the Sunday on which we remember the transfiguration of the Lord. May you find in this time of worship a time of fellowship, a time of peace, but also a time to think of spiritual things, to reflect on their impact on your life and to be challenged by what God's Word is saying to you. In short, may you know God's presence in this hour. I would welcome everyone to our service, and if you are a visitor, I hope that you will feel part of our family here at Christ Church. I would invite visitors to sign the visitor's book at the back of the North Isle, and to join us for refreshments after the service. Being the first Sunday of the month, it is, of course, Spaghetti Sunday, and spaghetti and other such things can be left at the foot of the font there. And at the end of the service, we will have a short celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, to which all who love the Lord Jesus Christ are warmly invited. Those who wish to remain for that, please gather in the front pews of the North Isle immediately after the service. The Lord is King. Let the people tremble. Let them praise you, your great and awesome name. Extol the Lord our God and worship at his holy mountain, for the Lord our God is holy. These words of the psalmist call us to worship today, and so let us begin that worship as we sing hymn 120, God we praise you, God we bless you. We sing this to the first tune, Ode to Joy. We have sung our praises to God. 
So now let us resume our seats as we come before him to bring him our prayers of adoration and confession. Let us pray. Eternal, majestic God, creator of life and light, you bring order out of chaos and light out of darkness, and so we bring you our praise and adoration. All glory and majesty, wisdom and authority belong to you now and forever, and yet we can approach you as Father, and this we now do to confess our sins the ways in which we have fallen short. We have glimpsed your glory, but there have been times when we've chosen darkness rather than light. We have heard your voice calling us, but we have not always listened. We have claimed to follow Jesus, but so often we've chosen to go our own way. Father, forgive us for all our buts. Help us to know that we are loved and forgiven, and to walk in the light of your love. Open our eyes to the glory of your presence in the world around us, but chiefly in the face of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that we may grow into his likeness and attain the happy fulfillment of our hope when the splendor of the Savior will be revealed through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We sing the hymn number 484, Great God, your love has called us here. We sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Please be seated. Boys and girls, do you want to come out to the front? I've got a question for you this morning. You always ask children questions with a little bit of trepidation because you never quite know what answer you're going to get. And this one might be interesting. Oh, spaghetti, good, good, good. My question for you this morning is, have any of you ever seen God? No, that's a good answer. He's up there, okay. Hmm? You've seen God? Where? In? Oh, in a cloud. Now, that's interesting because God does often, in fact, more often than not, seems to appear in a cloud. 
Okay, that's fine. That's a sensible answer. Well, yes. So well, there you are. You think Joe's God? <laughs> yeah, he is always next to us, but we don't really see him. Uh, it's not surprising that we haven't seen God, because when John was writing his gospel, one of the things he wrote was, no one has ever seen God. And I think that is generally true. It's really not possible for us to look on God. Um, I wonder, can you think of something else in the world that you can't look at directly? Um, air. air. Well, yeah, I know what you mean. That's not what I was thinking of. Space. Space. Well, you're heading in the right direction. You can look up at space, I suppose. You don't terribly see it terribly clearly. Levi. The sun. You're right. You can't, or at least you shouldn't, look directly at the sun. It can actually damage your eyes if the sun is particularly bright and you look directly at it. And in a sense, God is kind of like that. His glory is so bright, so radiant, that we can't really look at it. And coming back to seeing God in a cloud, that's how in the Old Testament, most of the people who had an encounter with God, people like Moses, never actually saw God. What they saw was a cloud uh, which hid God, and they maybe heard a voice, uh, they maybe saw bright light, but they never actually saw God. Uh, and somebody else was quite right when you said God is always beside you, because God is always present wherever we are, but He keeps Himself kind of hidden from us. And in the Bible, we find that God appearing in a cloud is a common thing. And it doesn't matter whether it's the story of Moses uh, when he encounters God or when the cloud comes into the tabernacle where the Jewish people prayed. Uh, and again, it was the cloud that filled the temple uh, when Isaiah had his vision of God and heard the angels singing, holy, holy, holy. And in our gospel reading for today that the adults will hear in a little while, uh, when Jesus took three of his disciples up to the top of a mountain uh, because they were kind of worried about what Jesus had said was going to happen to him, and Jesus took them up there so that they could see something else about him. And what they saw, again, was the hidden glory of God and a voice speaking from a cloud and saying of Jesus, you know, this is my son, uh, listen to him. And that's what God had to say to the disciples when they were up on the top of this mountain. And the disciples didn't really know what to do, but they were sure that they had to tell people what had happened, what they had seen. But Jesus didn't want them to do that. He really told them that they were to keep it a kind of secret, until all the things that were going to happen to him in Jerusalem through Palm Sunday, through the events of Holy Week, and through Easter uh, actually happened. And so eventually they did tell people about what happened on top of the mountain. And again, John in his gospel writes, we saw his glory, the glory which he received as the Father's only Son. So maybe we don't see God, but that doesn't really matter. Uh, you could draw a picture of God and you could draw it any way you like. You're as likely to be correct in your picture of God as anybody else uh, because none of us really knows. But the light of God is something that we can all live in. And we're going to sing about that. We're going to sing the hymn, We Are Marching in the Light of God. Now, there's only one verse for this in the hymn book. But Oliver, could we play three verses... And the second verse, we're going to sing, we are living in the love of God. And the third verse, we are moving in the peace of God. I'll try and shout out between the verses just to remind you. So, as in the hymn book for verse 1, verse 2, we are living in the love of God. And verse 3, we are moving in the power of God. And this is a hymn that uh, really originates as part of the anti-apartheid movement in, in, Africa, in South Africa. Uh, and that's really the origin of this hymn. But we are marching in the light of God, hymn 516. <laughs> Oh, God. 
living in the love of God. in the power of God. Lord, as our children leave us now for their time at CCY, bless them in all they do, that they may indeed march in your light as they journey through life. Amen. Have a good morning, boys and girls. Have a good morning as well. Listen now for God's Word as He speaks to us through the pages of the Gospels, turning this morning to the Gospel according to St. Luke, and reading in chapter 9, verses 28 to 36. You'll find this on page 69 of the New Testament section of the Pew Bibles. Luke, chapter 9, reading from verse 28, and it's the story of the Transfiguration. Now, about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them. And they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. Amen. The transfiguration is one of the high points in Mark's gospel, and not just because it takes place on the top of a mountain. It is a dramatic moment of divine disclosure, intended to provide insight into the question posed by Jesus to his disciples just a week before when he asked them, who do you say that I am? Peter's response, you are the Messiah, discloses at least partial understanding. But when Jesus then went on to talk about his need to suffer and die, Peter and the other disciples seriously wondered what this was all about. And here, just a few days later, we have Jesus giving them a glimpse of a different reality, one far removed from what he had told them about the human Jesus having to suffer and die one that spoke of a heavenly reality. This event, the transfiguration, is as much about the content of God's declaration as it is about the phenomenon itself. Luke 
merely, merely gives a fleeting and a kind of matter-of-fact account of the phenomenon. He uses very few words indeed. But the appearance of two key figures from Israel's past, Moses and Elijah, clearly points beyond Jesus' humanity. Something made even more clear in the words of the voice from the cloud, the voice of God. This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. And that's the key point. The disciples are given a glimpse into the reality of Jesus' exalted role in the kingdom, as are those to whom Luke is writing. And that was probably a fairly educated Greek-speaking audience. Indeed, Luke himself tells us at the very beginning of his gospel that he has set out to write an orderly account so that you may know the truth. Included in that truth was and is that the crucifixion is not the end. Jesus had been declared to be God's beloved son. They were not to look for some kind of earthbound kingdom, as Peter had done in his desire to erect three dwellings on the top of the mountain. Rather, they were to continue listening to God's Son, even if it meant following Him in the way of the cross. For a love stronger than death would bring about their own transfiguration, just as it will do ours. Now there's a promise. What a prospect that we might be transformed from what we are into a greater likeness of Jesus, a greater likeness of the image of God in which we've all been made, that there is something of the divine within each and every one of us. If only we will be open to allowing our human selves, firstly, to listen to God's Son, and then having listened, to live in the way that Jesus teaches. The transfiguration may be about the divinity of Jesus, but it's also about the possibility of our transformation, a transformation that God wants us to at least begin to achieve here and now by our following in the way of Jesus so that we become more like him thereby restoring our relationship with God and with all God's creation. Our role may not be to sit at God's right hand, but it's certainly to be reunited with Him, to share all that He offers to us so that His light might shine in the world through us. We sing the hymn number 355, You, Lord, are both Lamb and Shepherd. We sing it to the tune Regent Square. <clears throat>
hear the message of God proclaimed in the Old Testament. The first reading is from the book of Exodus, chapter 34, from verses 29 to 35. You will find it on page 81 in the Old Testament, the shining face of Moses. Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and as he came down from the mountain with two tablets of the covenant in his hand, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. When Aaron and all of the Israelites saw Moses, the skin of his face was shining, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him, and Moses spoke with them. Afterward, all the Israelites came near, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him on Mount Sinai. When Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take the veil off until he came out. And when he came out and told the Israelites what he had been commanded, the Israelites would see the face of Moses, that the skin of his face was shining, and Moses would put the veil on his face again until he went in to speak with him. Our second reading is from 2 Corinthians, chapter 3, verse 12 through chapter 4, verse 6. Uh, 3, 12 through 4, 6. You will find it on page 180 of the New Testament. Since then, we have such a hope that we act with great boldness, not like Moses who put a veil over his face to keep the people of Israel from gazing at the end of the glory that was being set aside. But their minds were hardened. Indeed, to this very day when they hear the reading of the Old Covenant, that same veil is still there, since only in Christ is it set aside. Indeed, to this very day, whenever Moses is read, the veil lies over their minds. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And all of us, with unveiled faces, seeing the glory of the Lord as though reflected in a mirror, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, the Spirit. Therefore, since it is by God's mercy that we are engaged in this ministry, we do not lose heart. We have renounced the shameful things that one hides. We refuse to cunning or falsify God's word. But by the open statement of the truth, we commend, oursel commend ourselves to the conscience of everyone in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds to the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. For we do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Blessed be the word of God. The anthem is Softly and Tenderly, words by Will Thompson, music by Raymond Brown, arranged by Tom Fetke.
We heard in the reading from Paul's letter, uh, him telling us that worldly gods are what are keeping the light of the good news from shining on the people in Corinth. And is that any less true today? Aren't the worldly gods of self-importance, of success, of fame and celebrity, of ambition and of countless other things that the world tempts us to strive after, keeping the light of the good news from shining in our world. The obscure people seeing that Jesus is the likeness of God. The obscure people seeing that the church is here to serve, to preach the good news of Jesus Christ, to be the light that shines in the world. And for we who are the church, that is still our privilege, to be the light that shines in God's world. God has given us His light in our hearts, not solely for our own benefit, but to bring it to shine in the hearts of others, that they too might see the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus. As we heard in that reading, Paul tells the Corinthians, we do not proclaim ourselves, we proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord. Jesus is Lord, proclaims the familiar hymn that was included in Songs of God's People, yet strangely perhaps omitted from CH4. 
And it echoes the earliest recorded Christian hymn that we have in Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 6 to 11, a hymn that ends with these words, every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. If we really do mean it when we say that Jesus Christ is Lord, then it follows that we must be His servant or as Paul more fully expands it, your slaves for Jesus' sake. If then we are to be slaves or servants for Jesus' sake, we must be careful that we resist substituting for His gospel one of our own making, and that we desist from subordinating His gospel to our own aggrandizing agendas. Nor is it about outward show as Paul makes clear when he says that God made his light shine in our hearts, not, you will note, in our faces. It's what's in the heart that matters, not a question of having the most radiant image, even in the world of today, where image is so often seen as everything. Let us hear again the concluding verses of our reading, but this time I, I want to read them from the interpretation by Eugene Peterson in the message. He writes as follows, remember, our message is not about ourselves. We are proclaiming Jesus Christ, the Master. All we are is messengers, errand runners from Jesus for you. It started when God said, light up the darkness, and our lives filled up with light as we saw and understood God in the face of Christ, all bright and beautiful. If then we are to be messengers, we need to do three things. Firstly, we need to listen to the one whose message we are taking. And so, we need to know this story in which we all find ourselves. We need to read it and try to understand what it's saying to us today. Then secondly, we need to allow that message, that light, to enter into our hearts, to fill our lives so that it might be part of us, part of the life we live, that the light of Christ, the glory of God, may be seen in some small way in the life of each and every one of us who profess to be followers of Jesus Christ. And then thirdly, we need to share that light, to tell the story in the way we live our lives. For if we don't do that, how is the story to be told? Where is the light to be seen? Last Sunday, I spoke about the need to recover a spirit of prophecy in the church. So, let me follow that up today by suggesting that you've maybe not been as good as you could or should be in following this process. Firstly, how seriously are you taking the need to seek God's will for the world today? If I take as a measure in the, con the number in the congregation who attend Bible study, for example, you're not. Equally, and here I accept I'm preaching at least, uh, I was preaching to, to those least in need of hearing it. If I take as a measure the proportion of those on the roll who come to worship on a Sunday, today I'm guessing between the two services, we're probably about 140, something of that sort, out of a roll of 500 plus another 70 odd adherents. Again, as a congregation, you are not. And so you're falling at the first hurdle. Maybe there's a need to encourage our fellow members in their walk of faith. Maybe we need to motivate ourselves to take advantage of events such as the screening of the DVD, The Passion, which is going to be done over two Wednesdays in March, the 16th and the 23rd. But the second challenge is in allowing God's message to enter your hearts and become central in your lives. And I know there are people in this congregation who do their best to do just that. But clearly, there are many more 
who, at best, pay kind of lip service to their faith and fail to live it out in any obvious, meaningful way. And perhaps there's a need to help to bring these nominal members back into the life and worship of Christ church. And so to hurdle three, are you sharing the light of God, the light that God has shared with you, with others? When, for example, did you last invite a friend or neighbor to come along to church with you? Aren't we all agents of God's mission? If you want Christ church to survive, never mind grow, you need to be doing all these things. Just to be content with how things are really is not an option. Every congregation needs to be a vibrant living organism, seeking to ascertain and then to pursue God's mission wherever it is in the world. Once again, I say these things, I offer you these things out of love, and I pray that you are willing to take on the challenges involved. Indeed, I believe that there is within this congregation the potential to become the vibrant living organism that I referred to. It may not be easy, for you do have hurdles to overcome, but don't allow either complacency or naysayers to swamp you. I want you to be the best that you can be. What you will be, though, rests with you. My prayer would be that the world might see in you the light of Christ and believe. To God alone be the glory. Amen. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. We sing hymn 448, perhaps better known as Shine, Jesus, Shine.
Let us continue our worship in the giving of our offering. Let us pray. In the stillness, Lord, may your power transform this offering of ours into a means of ensuring the continuing shining of your glory here in this place. We bring you our offering as a token of our thanks, asking that you will use it and us in the service of your kingdom to your glory. Amen. Church news for this week uh, seems quite lengthy. Um, a reminder uh, of the invitation to remain on at the end of the service for a short celebration of the sacrament of Holy Communion. At six o'clock tonight, uh, there will be a service for wholeness and healing here in the church, and I hope that as many people as are able will come to that. Uh, it's no excuse that Super Bowl is on tonight. That doesn't start till 7.30. Uh, so you can be here at 6 and be home in time to see it start. You just miss all the rubbish before it. Uh, <laughs> and believe it or not, there is actually a Scotsman playing in it tonight. Uh, from our broth, only a few miles from my birthplace. Uh, playing for the, the Carolina Panthers. So I, I don't know if that's your team or not, but... Uh, if, if, you want them, if you want to support the team, support the team with the Scotsman. <laughs> That's thrown me. Uh, <laughs> Thursday night, uh, Bible study in the manse at half past seven. Uh, the theme this week, if I remember rightly, is serving others. Then on Friday night, uh, we have fun for the entire family with the screening of Madagascar. Uh, from six till eight uh, in the Thorburn Hall. So for the, the young, the young at heart, even those in their second childhood can come along and enjoy uh, an evening uh, together on Friday. Then, what have we? Um, a reminder that uh, we are looking still for people to help with the flower ministry, with providing flowers for the, the sanctuary on a Sunday, uh, and then to be distributed to, to folk in the congregation. You'll notice on uh, the program that uh, you, there's details of the Bermuda Overseas Missions trips for this year. Uh, they are listed there, and I've just heard just before the service that they still have some vegetarian rotis available to be bought uh, for $10 uh, a time. Speak to Anne Spencer Arscott after the service if you're looking for some vegetarian rotis to support BOM. Um, what else have I got written here? Oh, yes, the uh, Warwick Ministerial Alliance Joint Lent Services begin on Tuesday week, the 16th, here in Christ Church, uh, when the preacher will be Pastor Eugene Joel. Uh, and the theme through the whole of the, the joint services is uh, the women who walked with Jesus, thinking about the road to Calvary. And Eugene is to be uh, speaking about Mary Magdalene. So that's 7.30, uh, Tuesday week, the 16th, 
here in Christ Church. The following week, the 23rd, uh, the service is in Bright Temple AME when I will be preaching. Uh, so a, a three-line whip for that. Uh, to mention that, uh, the International Presbytery Vacancy Procedure Committee met on Thursday and sustained the call of the congregation to the Reverend Alistair Bennett to be your next minister uh, and set the date for the service of induction as Friday the 13th of May at 7 p.m. here in Christchurch, obviously. Um, you'll get fo more formal notice of that later, but I just wanted to let you know that we are now on the, the final lap of filling your vacancy. Uh, and you're coming to an end of having to put up with me on a Sunday morning. Uh, thinking about uh, the call, uh, I'm wondering if there is anybody in the congregation with a, a skill in calligraphy uh, in order to do a kind of front piece on this. Uh, if there is anybody, please speak with me after the service. Um, I, I have... I have a half a volunteer from the 8 o'clock service, but she did say if you find anybody better, she'll, she'll happily not do it. Uh, but, so I do have someone. Uh, but if there is somebody with the, the gift of, of calligraphy or who has acquired the skill of calligraphy, uh, please speak with me. I think, I think that is all. Let us once again bring ourselves to God in prayer. Loving God, we give thanks that you are always here for us in every part of our lives, even when we shut the door on you or close our ears to your word. For you have revealed your hidden glory in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Christ, you have given us the hope of life eternal. We pray that your church may be alight with the radiance of your presence, that your brightness may enliven our worship, and that all who preach and teach might have a vision of your glory. Lord of light, transform the dark places of the world by your presence. We remember all who live in slums and shanty towns, and all who live in temporary shelters or have no adequate shelter at all. Let the radiance of your presence and the compassion of people and governments bring hope to their lives. We remember all who suffer, all who are in hospital or who are undergoing treatments, all who are lonely and feel rejected, all who feel their lives to be under a dark cloud. We think of those who are fearful of the future and those whose lives are full of sadness. Lord, may the light of your love transform their lives. Glorious God, we ask that you will fill our homes with your love and our lives with your glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, in whose words we now join together to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Did I mention this evening's service? I can't remember. There were so many into I did, that's fine. <laughs> Memory's going. <laughs> Bad sign. Our concluding praise this morning. Uh, is uh, the hymn 476, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
as you leave this place of worship to serve God in the world, the glory of the Lord goes with you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with kindness and give you peace today and always.